spraying it, if they would have sprayed it that fall, they probably would have got a way better control. But they didn't get around to spraying it. So you know, the, the fire can be used to stimulate plants as well. But then also the timing. Also, uh, one of the, some of the research shows that if you're going to do a bottle control release, uh, fire actually can be effective for stimulating the, the flea beetles on leafy spurge. So if you burn in the fall while the beetles are underground, when they come out in the spring, uh, there's less competition for plants, and so then it's easier for them to go after that leafy spurge plant, and it finds it shown to be more effective. Um, some of the work done in the states is showing sort of that integrated approach. So using a combination of burning and physical control, like mowing, or uh, uh, you know, so if you're looking at doing shrub control, you know, running a fire, then you get that resuckering that goes on, and then you hit it with a mower. Sometimes that could be effective. Uh, Biocontrol, I mentioned, with leafy spurge could be effective. Also that burning and then using herbicides. So you, you, you burn it, it resuckers, and then you spray it because that plant is pulling out its root reserves. And so it's already, you know, it's already hurt, and then it, you hit it with herbicide, it becomes more effective. Um, also that combination of uh, grazing, uh, grazing and burning can be done as well. And, and especially if you're trying, and what we found, I mentioned before in the swale, that combination of burning and grazing uh, was quite effective on controlling that uh, snowberry and wolf willow. But it would have to be with a sheep or a goat, right? You know, not cattle, because cattle probably won't go after too much shrubs. But that combination was quite effective. And then also using burning for uh, restoration projects. So if you're going to seed your land down to grass, whether it's even hay or um, down to native prairie, quite often weed control is your number one issue, right? Uh, that's probably your number one failure to any grass seeding is, other than you know, drought, is probably weeds. And so sometimes burning that area before you start the restoration process might be beneficial. You know, it depends on the conditions. So there's sort of four or five, four main sort of terms for fires, right? So everyone thinks of wildfire, you know, that's what happens up in the boreal forest every year, you know, the big fires that occur. The fire that happened at Burst Falls, uh, unfortunately, that happened in October, that was a wildfire, right? It got away, it was either intentionally or accidentally started, and just gets away in no control, and there's no planning. A convenience burn, that's sort of uh, when you go out sort of Easter Sunday, and, oh, I want to burn out my uh, sluice, that would be a convenience burn, you know, no one's around to report me type of thing. I know some people back home that do that, <clears throat> including my dad. Uh, control burn is when you, uh, you control the time, so okay, I'm going to burn on this day. You know where you're going to burn, and you have some control methods with you. You've got water, you've got the cultivator hooked up, you're ready to go. However, the difference between a controlled burn and a prescribed burn is prescribed burn, you have a very specific management objectives and you have a very specific plan. So like with a prescribed burn, it would be my management objective is to, to knock back that wolf willow. And then my timing is going to be specifically to knock back that wolf willow. And then you plan around that. Uh, whereas a controlled burn is, okay, it's a nice day out, we're going to go and burn it. Right? So that, that's sort of the differences. And between the two. Okay. So, in, in terms of when you're uh, uh, sort of within birds, there's sort of there's training courses, there's workshops, there's certifications as well for prescribed birds. I <coughs> uh, I have a I have a wildfire training from Parks Canada uh, level one. I think it is grassland fire. I know Carolyn, I think you must have level one too. And uh, you know it, it, it's so that there's a standardized training for burning. Uh, there's a group of uh, there's several uh, groups in Saskatchewan that use fires for um, land management. So Parks Canada, Environment Canada, uh, Saskatchewan Provincial Parks, uh, Nature Conservancy is looking at using fire as well as a management tool, and New Austin University of Saskatchewan. So you know we're working together on developing standards and practices. We're also doing some joint burns together. But we're trying to, you know, try and minimize that risk with these burns. Um, part of the, when, we're, when we conduct burns, safety is the number one factor, and having everything prepared ahead of time. You know, so having you know water available, uh, using things like block, uh, natural fire breaks or roads as a fire guard. Uh, also, 
uh, try to create back black lines. So what you have this burnt out vegetation that you use as a as a fire guard. Uh, black line. Usually, what you can do is you can what we typically do at New Austin is we'll mow grass and then we'll burn in between that, and that's our black line. So you've removed all that vegetation and any risk of that fire. And then different. Uh, we also when we do a burn, uh, all our everyone has. Uh, Nomex coveralls that are fireproof resistant. Uh, we carry water packs on our back with some hand sprayers. And we also carry something like a, it's called a flapper, which is a hockey stick with a mud flap on it. And just to, you know, just smush out that fire. Works quite well, a little bit more effective than a, uh, a great shovel, because you can really get it flapping really good. And then also we make sure we have lots of water on site. And then using different burn techniques, we use a drip torch. Uh, which is a mix of gas and diesel that drips beads of fire onto the ground. And we use different burning techniques. So uh, backfires when you're burning into the wind. So it creeps along very slowly and the wind's pushing it this way. What that does is it creates a real slow burn that can really get into, you know, into the vegetation. When you uh, shift to a head fire, you start here and it burns into the wind or burns with the wind. That creates a really fast fire, so like that big burst off fire, you know, that was a massive headwind, you know, 120 kilometer winds, right? So that carried it so fast. So you use that the wind to go with it. So it moves along faster, but it doesn't burn down into that thick thatch layer. So, if I, so those pictures of that Kentucky bluegrass with those um, dead grass still sitting there, that would have been caused by a head fire. It didn't have a chance to burn right down to it. And then also some other techniques is using sort of a side fire as well, and that's called flank fire. So different sort of terminology for different firing techniques. Uh, the funnest, uh, the most time consuming is creating the black line. Second most time consuming, well, I'm sorry, most of the time consuming is creating the fire guards. Then second is creating that black line. Third is doing the back fire. And then that head fire goes really fast. But you want to make sure you have everything in place before you start that head. So I'm going to show a, video, a quick one minute video of a prescribed burn we did last spring. Uh, this is at that swale. Uh, the city created a storm pond to handle water coming out of the, this community here. So what they did was they dug a giant dugout, pretty much, a 28, 22 acre dugout. And uh, with an outlet from the wet pond here. So this is where the wet pond dug out. And this is a dry pond which handles all the excess floodwaters. And this is the channel that goes from the underground pipe to the river. City dug that out about eight years ago and then just walked away. They didn't see any grass or no cover, nothing. Okay, so you know what you get, tansy and absinthe and black grass. So now um, New Austin's working with the city to restore that site. Uh, so last year, the first thing we did was we uh, did a prescribed burn to clear everything out. And then we're starting the whole restoration process. Um, that site was actually, I, I'm on the board of the South Saskatchewan River Watershed Stewards and also the Invasive Species Council for Saskatchewan. And that's actually the site where we to, do all our invasive species tours in Saskatoon. Because there's everything you need to see for invasive species is right at that pond. Now that I've started doing the restoration project, we have to find a new location. So this was a video that we did. It's uh, just showing sort of the process we go through for a prescribed burn. I think it works. Oh, here it goes. Hard to tell, but here we are creating the black line. We're on. We have a road as a fire guard. And we're creating that black line going down the ditch. If you, can, you can't quite see, but I'm the guy, the guy in yellow with the drip torch. And then we got crews with water packs and flappers keeping the fire, putting it out. And we're trying to create that big black line around the, the burn. So we're burning that out. That, uh, it's not as fast as it looks. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you my burn, I'll tell you what our burn conditions are. Right away. So this is, now we're doing our uh, back burns and head fires down through the bottom. As you can see, it's all quack grass and weeds. But that's where we're doing small head fires into that. So in terms of our prescribed burning, uh, our burn conditions that we set at Mewasin, which is a little bit different than some of the other organizations, is uh, maximum 20 kilometer hour winds. 
Minimum is about five kilometers away. So try that. If it's dead calm, you start getting funny things occurring. If you get a little pick up a wind, right, things act funny. So it's about five to uh, five to twenty with stable winds. You know, not too up and down and stable direction. Uh, our relative humidity is twenty percent to sixty percent. Anything over sixty, you pretty hard to burn grass. Under twenty percent humidity, very very scary. You know, and it really you know you, you can. When you hit that 10%, you know, you're walking across rocks and start a fire, 20% is getting pretty close to that. And trying to manage that is pretty tough. Uh, so wind and temperature uh, between 0 and 20 degrees Celsius. Anything over 20 degrees, it starts getting pretty hot out. Easier, you know, the fire is a little bit more unpredictable. Also, you, you get pretty tired carrying, you know, those water packs, the water pack I'm carrying here, that's 50 pounds of water on you. So when it gets pretty hot, it makes for a long day. So we have very specific burn conditions. Also, we try and control uh, smoke. So the wind has to be certain wind direction, you know, and we don't want the smoke to blow into the city or into neighbor's you know, house, or if the wind is blowing towards an area that just in case the fire jumps, we don't want to burn into there. So we try and manage our smoke and also wind directions as well. So each burn unit that we plan, so like at the swale for next year, I have a I'm planning uh, up to 10 burns. I'll be lucky if I do two of them. But each burn has a very specific objectives and very specific wind and you know, moisture and timing and also that I want to try and follow through. Uh, training is uh, imperative. I'm actually at Nuwasan, we actually have probably the least strictest profiles of some of the other groups. Uh, most of the other groups don't allow anyone to be on their bird unless they have the wildland fire certificate. However, myself, I'm the only person on staff that has that training, but I'm, I'm looking at it as an opportunity in Saskatoon to give people that initial training, and then when there is an opportunity to take a larger course, they can go and take that course. Uh, depending on their skill set and their experience, you know, that depends where I put them on the fire line as well. Uh, a couple of guys, I'll just make them observers, and uh, other people, I'll put them right on the fire line. There's Matthew. Yeah, we can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Shaky and tall. <laughs> yeah. So in, in this fire here, or in this burn here, um, I have uh, um, people from Nature Conservancy, City of Saskatoon, Ministry of and uh, Ministry of Agriculture, and Environment Canada helping out on this burn. Um, also, you know, the, uh, I really can't emphasize the site preparation. You know. Uh, I probably prepared this year enough, I think about 25 or 25 burns this year. We I mean, are cutting fire guards, mowing and everything. I'll be lucky if I get five done. But because each, each burn unit is different than the rest of them, and if the conditions are good, I'll go into that burn. If it's not good, I might be able to hit that burn. But uh, you know, the key, you can't burn unless you have the site prepared. So having that site preparation is uh, paramount. Uh, make sure you have the resources and equipment available and the number of people. Uh, I've shown some pictures of uh, winter burning you know, between snowbanks. I can go and do that with two people, right? Because the fire's not going to go anywhere. It's cool. You don't have to worry. If I get into a situation like this burn here, I, I probably have to, uh, maybe twice as many people that I need it, but it never hurts to have too many people, right? As long as you know how to control them and where they are. And we, and we use an instant command system as well. Uh, communications, uh, we do a lot of communications when we do a burn. Uh, we put a notice, we send a notice out to the media if we're doing a burn that day. Uh, we do a lot of public awareness about burns. And also all the burns that we do, we get the proper permits. Uh, in Saskatoon with the fire chief, or the fire marshal, he signs off on every burn that we do. And then we have, uh, I'm in constant communication with the fire department. And if it's outside of the city and in the RM, I'm also in constant communication with their fire control people as well. And then also, our, all our burns are registered with the provincial call center. Like all producers, you're supposed to call uh, the provincial call center if you light a fire. If it gets away, at least you cover under insurance. Yeah. So this is uh, one burn we did. Uh, we were burning around that storm pond. Uh, what my, my objective was that this area hadn't been grazed or burned or anything in about 15 years. Wanted to open up that grass a little bit, get rid of that dead litter. So what I did, I didn't have to, but I wanted to create a nice black fire guard along that wetland. It wouldn't have gone anywhere, 
but it was part of that training exercise with my co-workers and colleagues. And then once we got that uh, black line going, the wind was from the east going west. Uh, that day the wind was only running at about 10 to 12 kilometers an hour. Relative humidity was about 30%. So we did black line along the road here, and you can see this black line being formed along here. So then we were starting to do the head fire into the Aspen stand, and uh, I, that our primary objective was to hit, hit the uh, Aspen stand with fire if the conditions were right. Secondary objective was to burn off some of that old dead grass. And uh, just as I'm run, that's me running across with the head fire, the uh, relative humidity dropped. All of a sudden, you can just feel it drop to 20%, and the wind picked up to 20K as I'm walking across there. So I had two options, go with it or put it out real quick. So we decided to go with it. And uh, it went right through that Aspen stand exactly in the textbook case. I didn't, there, there was only about 10% chance of being, us being able to do that burn. And it just happened right. However, when that smoke went up, my cell phone was ringing off the hook. Uh, from, fire, uh, from the fire marshal, they had about 15 people phone in and say, there's a mushroom cloud in that part of the city, is that you? <laughs> it was me. But also what was happening, when I got to the far end of the line and it got, uh, uh, that smoke was going up, along the road, I had about 100 vehicles coming down, up and down the road. I had one person there directing traffic. I had to bring two people over to direct traffic. And my water truck was on this side, and that was my worst area for fire escape. For, for fire escaping, but I had to bring her around with the water truck just to have her present so that people could see that we were there with some water. And uh, by that time, though, that I, the conditions were good that she can come around, but... So this was the result. Uh, we got into that Aspen stand, and uh, you can see nice gray charcoal or uh, ash. We were burning off Aspen at about this height, so the went through really, really hot. Uh, I don't have a follow-up picture from the next year, but the, last year everything resuckered and total new regrowth of the aspen. And actually that's what was my objective was to renew the growth of that aspen. It was starting to become decadent old growth and I just wanted to have it resucker. Now if I wanted to control that aspen, I would have stuck my sheep or goats in there and you know, did some work on that aspen. But my objective was to renew that aspen stand. Uh, a couple other burns, you know, fire crew uh, slowly burning away at a fire guard. You know, you've got lots of leaning on uh, flappers and taking lots of time. Um, that one was an old restoration field. Uh, we seeded it down to grass in, uh, I think it was 2009. So it was seeded down to native grass. The grass hadn't been managed since, so it had never been hayed, never been grazed. There was no fencing. I talked to a couple of the producers in the area to see if they wanted to take bales off. Uh, one guy drove in there with his, uh, actually he walked across it and he said, way too rough. I'm not going to take my hay behind in there. So what we did was we decided we were going to burn it. And I was getting flame lights about this high because there was so much growth in there. Now that grass is looking really good and now I can actually do something with it. Um, but yeah, each fire has a different impact and different timing. So, yeah, fire can be an effective tool for weed control and in, uh, wildlife habitat. And actually that integrated approach to using multiple different tools. And then the timing of burns can result in different yields, or results. And uh, it can be a safe management tool if you properly plan for it and you have the resources in place. And, you know, reducing that risk is number one key. Um, you know, I, I conduct a lot of prescribed burns and uh, I lose sleep over them, you know, before the burn but we try and minimize all the risk uh, with pre-planning and implementation. And if a fire looks like it's gonna go bad, I have actually one colleague, she runs our water truck. She's on the hill with the radio and she's by, I call her my, my little white angel on the shoulder. She tells me whether to go or not go. So if she feels that the conditions aren't right, I shut her down right there. She's sort of watching the, the, the surroundings for me. And uh, there's been a couple times where you know, you know, she says, oh, shut down, so we put out the fire real quick, and then we have a big gust of wind come through. And then, you know, if we would have been burning during that gust of wind, you know, who knows what would have happened, right? So it's, it's taking that precaution. Uh, this was a burden we did last spring. 
uh, back in April, and then we went out in June, and the Tiger Lilies, that's the red lilies from full bloom. So, any questions? Yeah, Shirley. What is the best way to I guess my question is, what proportion of native forbs do you get coming back after a after a after cover? Yeah. yeah. So a lot of these stands, um, especially like at the swale where there's a lot of Kentucky bluegrass, so we're sitting at 50% Kentucky bluegrass. The year after a burn, we're we're seeing uh, probably a 50% increase in wildflowers, and everything from uh, buffalo bean to crocus, you know, just that big flush, right? And, uh, and actually what we do is we, we do collect a lot of native seed for restoration purposes in New Boston. We have our own greenhouse. So I, quite often we go back to those sites for that. Uh, also after a burn, we, we monitor for three years. And what we've been finding is a couple of cases where maybe spurges popped up. You know, it was probably there, it was suppressed. Fire opened up the site and then all of a sudden we see the leafy spurge and we get on top of it right away. So we use that as you know, a tool to find some of this as well. But yeah, major increase in wildflowers afterwards. Uh, down at Cranberry Flats and Beaver Creek, especially Sandy Prairie site, that fire just really does a big difference on the wildflowers there. Totally different conditions. But uh, yeah, you know, it, it's it's a tool that can be used. If, um, let's say you know you've got somebody who's got a pasture full of weeds and using that prescribed burning the best. Who would they go about contacting? Yeah. yeah, and unfortunately there's no one in Saskatchewan that does custom prescribed burns in this province. I know BC has a few people, and in the States there are, but there's no one in Saskatchewan that does it. So that's one of the challenges. Uh, I, I know one rancher in the southeast part of Saskatchewan, he actually said he would actually like to do a prescribed burn on some of his land. And he's a fairly uh, uh, established rancher, but he says he doesn't have the skills or the resources to do it. And I think that's a limiting factor. And even within the uh, conservation agencies, it's a limiting factor, is that skill and resources. Can anyone go and just get the training for it? Like, yep. Level one certification? Yep, the level one certification. Yeah, when it's, uh, I know Grasslands National Park, when they offered it the one year, I think half the people in the room were uh, neighbors to the park, you know, ranchers and volunteer firefighters. And part, I think park's objective, though, was to, you know, get the, you know, the neighbors to understand the whole process as well, so which I think it was quite effective. And then there was a big grass fire that spring, so I think it, I think it helped uh, with that situation. So what are the logistic barriers, or or not logistic, maybe certified renewable barriers, certified barriers? No. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. stops the? Why is someone present to do this kind of burning? Why is it someone for hire? Um, I think insurance is one. You know, insurance is a um, is one you you know try and get some give you insurance for to do this now limiting barrier. Second is the training and well, qualifications. You know there isn't that many training courses available and it's sporadic. So I think you know to have a number of people trained as well. And uh, three is equipment. You know it takes quite a bit of equipment. Uh, like we also we have the minimal equipment. You should see some of the stuff some of the other agencies have what they roll in. So uh, that too is a limiting factor. So uh, you know, is there is there a business model for someone to, to provide this service uh, in Manitoba? Yes, I would say in Manitoba, in the Colorado Prairie, south of Winnipeg, there might be a demand for that. Here in Saskatchewan, not yet. Yeah, not yet. Maybe five years, ten years from now, maybe. So if the nature concerns wants to burn some land, what do you guys look to? And bring in partners to help. And bring in partners to help. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Nothing's well, falling. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, sir.